Good morning. It is Wednesday, September 9th, 2020. You can now relax and be informed. Here is your daily bite of news. Labor Day was a big weekend for flying. According to the Transportation Security Administration, more people flew over the holiday weekend than any other time during the coronavirus pandemic. More than 3.2 million passengers were screened from Friday to Monday. However, that's still much lower than the 8.6 million passengers who were screened over the same days last year. U.S. President Donald Trump will announce further troop withdrawals from Iraq and Afghanistan in the next few days, a senior administration official said Tuesday. In Afghanistan, the U.S. currently has 86,000 soldiers in accordance with a bilateral agreement signed in February between Washington and the Taliban. Trump previously mentioned that the White House aimed to reach 4,000 to 5,000 troops in Afghanistan by the November presidential election. Under the U.S.-Taliban deal, all foreign troops must leave the country by the spring of 2021 in exchange for security commitments from the militants. At least three volunteers linked to Russian opposition figure Alexei Navalny's team were taken ill on Tuesday after an attack on their office. Two men in tracksuits and wearing masks ran into the office of the opposition party, which is also the headquarters of Navalny's local team. One held the door, and the other one, while screaming profanities, threw a bottle of yellow liquid with a strong, pungent chemical smell into the room. Everybody had to leave the room because the smell was unbearable, and people started coughing. Three opposition volunteers fell ill with nausea and vomiting and were taken away by an ambulance. Elections are due to be held in the region later this month. A Belarusian activist has been ejected from the Eastern European country, according to a statement from the Belarusian Coordination Council. Olga Kovalkova, a confidant of the main Belarusian opposition candidate Svetlana, was removed from the country on Saturday night. Belarusian special services offered Olga two choices. She could be taken out of the country, or she would be kept in custody in Belarus, with further terms of imprisonment constantly added to her sentence. Olga was then masked by security service members, placed in the back of a car, and driven to the border. Once the activist was freed at the Polish side of the border, she boarded a regular bus to Warsaw. Svetlana is also in exile, having fled to the Baltic nation of Lithuania at the height of the protest movement against President Alexander Lukashenko of Belarus. For the first time in a generation, Americans begin spending more money at the supermarket than at places where someone else made the food. Grocers saw eight years of projected sales growth packed into one month. Shoppers began by building bomb shelter pantries. Then came a nostalgia phase with bowls of Lucky Charms and boxes of Little Debbies. Soon, it was followed by culinary stunts like sourdough starter and kombucha. Although kitchen fatigue is setting in for many, a new set of kitchen habits have been set. Before the coronavirus, 19% of Americans shopped for food more than three times a week. That number has dropped to 10% by June. A year ago, 81% of shoppers said they never turned to the internet for groceries. But in June, online grocery sales in the United States hit $7.2 billion. Produce sales have been riding high since March and are still up 11% from a year earlier. In May, grocers sold 73% more oranges than normal. Pandemic shopping has ushered in wider aisles, new methods of sanitation, and less crowded stores. After decades in which American supermarkets expanded to offer a wide selection of products and brands, they are pulling back on variety. Retailers report more interest in house brands. Frozen food is another surprise breakout. The fragility of the supply chain has pushed the movement towards food that is raised or produced locally. The Justice Department moved on Tuesday to replace President Trump's private legal team with government lawyers to defend him against a defamation lawsuit by the author E. Jean Carroll, who has accused him of raping her in a Manhattan department store in the 1990s. In a highly unusual legal move, lawyers for the Justice Department said in court papers that Mr. Trump was acting in his official capacity as president when he denied ever knowing Miss Carroll, and thus could be defended by government lawyers, in effect underwritten by taxpayer money. 
The motion also effectively protects Mr. Trump from any embarrassing disclosures in the middle of his campaign for re-election in November. Citing a law called the Federal Tort Claims Act, the department lawyers asserted the right to take the case for Mr. Trump's private lawyers and move the matter from state court to federal court. Ms. Carroll's lawyers have been requesting that Trump provide a DNA sample to determine whether his genetic material is on a dress that Ms. Carroll said she was wearing at the time of the encounter. Mr. Trump's private lawyers sought to have Ms. Carroll's suit dismissed by arguing that the Constitution gave a sitting president immunity against civil suits in state court. Just weeks after helping to broker a peace agreement between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, President Trump has been nominated for the 2021 Nobel Peace Prize once again by Christian Tybring Jaid, chairman of the Norwegian delegation to the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, who lauded Trump for his efforts toward resolving protracted conflicts worldwide. In his nomination letter, he said, It is expected other Middle Eastern countries will follow in the footsteps of the UAE, this agreement could be a game changer that will turn the Middle East into a region of cooperation and prosperity. He further praised Trump for withdrawing a large number of troops from the Middle East and for his efforts facilitating contact between conflicting parties, such as the Kashmir border dispute between India and Pakistan and the conflict between North and South Korea. The Nobel Peace Prize recipient is determined by a five-person Nobel Committee, which is appointed by the Norwegian Parliament. The winner of the Peace Prize for 2021 will not be announced until October of next year. AstraZeneca said Tuesday it had paused its global trials of its coronavirus vaccine because of an unexpected illness in one of its volunteers. A data and safety monitoring board usually monitors trials for adverse events and can order a pause or halt a trial, but AstraZeneca did not say who had stopped the trial. Some scientists downplayed the significance of the halt. Eric Topol, a cardiologist and clinical trials expert at the Scripps Research Transitional Institute in San Diego, said such pauses in large studies are not uncommon at all. There is a high likelihood the adverse event will turn out to not be related to the vaccine. For months, Americans have been told not to worry about the costs of coronavirus tests, which are crucial to stopping the spread. The Families First Coronavirus Response Act, passed in March, told insurers they cannot charge co-payments or apply deductibles to coronavirus tests and other items and services furnished during the doctor visit. The rules apply to tests both to detect the disease and to those for antibodies. The CARES Act built on those protections. But nationwide, people have been hit with unexpected fees and denied claims related to coronavirus tests, ranging from a few dollars to thousands. When asked about these charges, insurers faulted the complexity of American medical billing. Insurers can't know to cover a claim differently if hospitals and doctor offices don't use the right codes. The law states that insurers must cover services related to obtaining a coronavirus test, but don't identify what type of care makes the cut. Interestingly, patients at a drive through coronavirus testing site in Texas were unknowingly tested for sexually transmitted diseases and then billed for it. Rochester, New York Police Chief Laron Singletary and senior members of his command staff announced their retirements from the force Tuesday amid criticism from city leaders of the handling of the police-involved death of Daniel Prude earlier this year. Singletary was appointed chief in April 2019 and leaves with 22 years of service. Dallas Police Chief Renee Hall also announced her resignation Tuesday, the latest in a string of police chiefs to step down amid growing calls for police reform. Dallas Mayor Eric Johnson said he wasn't surprised by her pending departure. We cannot exclusively rely on law enforcement to reduce crime, but we absolutely need new policing strategies and fresh eyes that can help us reverse the unfortunate and unacceptable increase in violent crime in our city, he said in a statement. Hall became Dallas's top cop after spending 18 years with the Detroit Police Department. In Seattle, Police Chief Carmen Best recently left the force over efforts by city leaders to slash the police budget. Lyndon Cameron, a 13-year-old boy with Asperger syndrome, was seriously injured after being shot by a police officer in Salt Lake City on Friday night. His mother called the police and asked for a crisis intervention team to help her manage the situation with her son. 
The boy fled as police chased him, and one officer fired their weapon. Lyndon's injuries included damage to his shoulder, ankles, intestines, bladder, and colon, as well as nerve damage. His mother told CNN her son was unarmed. Detective Grave Wilking, a spokesman for the Salt Lake City Police Department, told CNN on Tuesday that he could not speak specifically to whether the boy had a weapon or what the officer's perceived threats were, and that those questions would be determined by the investigation. Salt Lake City Mayor Aaron Mendelhall said in a statement, No matter the circumstances, what happened on Friday night is a tragedy, and I expect this investigation to be handled swiftly and transparently for the sake of everyone involved. Europe's largest migrant camp, Moria, home to an estimated 13,000 people, has been completely destroyed after massive fires broke out early Wednesday at the overcrowded site. There are no reports of injuries so far. The camp is under lockdown after 35 people tested positive for COVID-19 earlier this week. A German charity group at the scene said a protest erupted at the camp on Tuesday night over lockdown measures. The Moria encampment extends out of the main UN camp into olive groves, where thousands live in makeshift wooden huts. The inhabitants say they wait for hours to use a bathroom and sometimes spend an entire day queuing for food. Alex Steyer, co-founder of Mission Life, said he warned that the situation would escalate over the camp's poor conditions. The refugees in Moria are not treated as humans. Among other things, we asked the German federal government again and again to evacuate all people from the Greek camps, but hardly anything has happened, Steyer added. The following are remarks made by President Trump on environmental accomplishments for the people of Florida, transcribed from the White House website. To safeguard our stunning coastal areas, I signed legislation authorizing $100 million to fight the red tide and toxic algae. We've directed over a half a billion dollars to fix the Herbert Hoover Dyke. We've expanded funding for the Everglades restoration by over 55% compared to four years ago. Last month, I signed the Great American Outdoors Act, the most significant investment in our national parks in over a century since Teddy Roosevelt. Through this legislation, we provided nearly $10 billion for long-delayed maintenance projects in our national parks. Earlier this year, I announced that the United States would join the One Trillion Trees Initiative. We've already had one billion trees pledged to be planted, and it's moving very rapidly. And we've invested over $38 billion in drinking water infrastructure to care for our children. I'm committing to ensuring the United States has the cleanest air and cleanest water on Earth. The contrast between our vision and the radical left has never been more clear. They talk a big game and they do nothing. That's really what it is, too. They talk and they talk. The environment. They talk and talk. Nothing happens. It's all talk. But today I have a very important announcement. I don't know if it's bigger than the things we just announced or the things that we've already done or we're in the process of completing. In a few moments, I will sign a presidential order extending the moratorium on offshore drilling on Florida's Gulf Coast and expanding it to Florida's Atlantic Coast, as well as the coasts of Georgia and South Carolina. We can take this step and the next step while remaining the number one producer of oil and natural gas anywhere in the world. We're the largest producer now in the world by far. We're number one in the world, and we are energy dependent, which is a nice sound. With fracking, the shale revolution, and the tremendous surge in American energy production, we're showing that we can create jobs, safeguard the environment, and keep energy prices low for America and low for our citizens. To my administration, environmental protection is a sacred obligation, and so does our duty to fight for the dreams and livelihoods of the citizens we serve. That will be all. If you would like to delve more into these topics, see links to our sources in the description below. Subscribe to this channel to receive a daily news update. Thanks for listening. Be relaxed, be informed, be connected.